All right, last time we were looking at this problem and then we found two different paths from 0, 4 to 8, 0. And then we found that they gave the same result. And I said that that wasn't a coincidence and that Um, something like this is called path independence. And not only that, it has something to do with gradient fields. So let's take a look at a gradient field and what that might do to a line integral problem. So these are the notes from last time. So now what I want to do today is I want to approach this line integral by putting in a gradient field and seeing what happens to that line integral when we put in the gradient field. So this is going to draw back to a bunch of things that we've studied in chapter 14 uh, and especially the chain rule. And so we'll take a look at that in detail. <clears throat> so what is a gradient field? Do you guys remember what a gradient field was? No, because everybody's thinking about the test. Not necessarily in 3D. It could be in two dimensions. So F is a gradient field if f is equal to the gradient of some other function little f of course we have to say there exists a function f such that blah 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 and uh, f is called little f is called remember what that was called potential function. Okay. So let's let's plop this gradient field So remember we're dealing with line integrals, right? So the line integral has a gradient has a has a vector field in the integrand and the differential is dr uh, which is a vector so we take the dot product of that um, so let's change the f capital F into the gradient of little f which is a vector it's a vector of partial derivatives And we could do this example in two dimensions, but we can easily extend it to three dimensions uh, later if we need to. But we can just say, let uh, r of t equals x of t, y of t, and then z if it's in 3D of t, uh, be a parameterization. Oh, let's, let's specify your t. Have I used this little e symbol here before? Element of, it's an element of um, a, b. So let's let that be a parameterization. Of the curve C. So then our integral will be an integral from A to B of the vector field. In this case, it happens to be a gradient field. Evaluate it at R of T. I could have put X of T, Y of T there, but let me try R of T for now. And then remember that dr becomes R prime of T. 
BT. So this is where we can look at this and say, hey, this, this looks uh, familiar. Maybe it doesn't. Does it look familiar? We could break it down and wrap it up again. What? It's a what? It's composite function. It looks like composition. It looks like derivative of a composite function, a composition of function, right? So, being that three people are convinced about that, I still have to convince the rest of you. Let's go on a little tangent. And break this down a little bit more. So this this guy over here is um, the partial uh, the gradient of f f f little f f is a potential f so f must be f of x y so the gradient of f must be uh, the partial of f with respect to x the partial of f with respect to y. And let's just, like I said, we're dealing with two dimensions right now. And then R prime would be the derivative of these x of t's and y of t's, dx dt, dy dt. And so we dot that, we get partial of f with respect to x times dx dt plus the partial of f with respect to y times dy dt. And if that does, still doesn't look familiar, we can look at, uh, we've associated a little tree chart so now does it look like composite of two functions in a chain rule all right if it still doesn't then just go with it so um, because f, this is a line integral. Whenever we're dotting, well, the one with vectors is a line integral. The one with scalars is a path integral. All right. <clears throat> so um, f is a function of x and y, but x and y in turn are a function of just one variable t. So this is like a uh, if I were to choose between one of these two symbols, which one would I choose? A straight D or a curly D? Straight D, right? Because in the end, it's only a function of one variable t, right? So this is a straight derivative t. That, that was like one of your exam questions, wasn't it? Yeah. The straight t equal to that. Okay? 
So back to this idea that this was a composition. This is a composition of F and R. So really, this is DDT of F composed with R of T. Is that okay? That's the inside of the integral. That can get replaced with this. Right? So it turns out that the integral of a derivative of a function is equal to the original function. Except we kind of say that loosely, right? But really, it's equal to the original function evaluated at the limits. So this is really the fundamental theorem of calculus. It's the integral of a derivative is equal to the original function. Or fundamental theorem of calculus says there's two parts in fundamental theorem of calculus. I don't know if you remember it in Calc 1, but it says the, the derivative of an integral is equal to the original function, and then the integral of a derivative is equal to the original function. But what they need to say there uh, as something that's added is that the, the integral of a derivative is equal to the original function evaluated at the boundaries. So let me restate some fundamental theorem of calculus business here. The integral of a derivative is equal to the original function evaluated at the boundaries. What that means is that this is equal to, now this is the original function, this is the act of taking the integral of a derivative of the original function. So this is your original function. So this must equal to f of r of t. And evaluate at the boundaries, we'll evaluate it. These are t limits, right? So we'll evaluate it when t is equal to a to t is equal to b. All right, now, so our final answer is f of r of b minus f of r of a. Now, let's take a closer look. So this is the answer, right? Let's take a closer look at r of a and r of b. Anybody tell me what? R of A and R of B are equal to? What's R? Position, right? It's parameterization of the curve C. So R, yeah. This is the curve C going in some particular orientation. And then so it's parameterized by R of T and R of, yeah. Well, it'd be XY because, I mean, if, if we're in two dimensions, it's going to be the starting point and the ending point. 
but not x here and then y here. It's x, y here, and x, y. But it's an x, y combination. It's a point. So when t is equal to a, the starting point, you're going to get some x, y value here. And when t is equal to b, the ending point, you're going to get another x, y value. So those are the x, y values that you would put in here. But in general, it's the starting point and ending point. And what's important is that this is for one curve C. If we had another curve C, if you have the same starting and ending point, you still get the same answer because this has nothing to do with what happens in the middle, right? So if you had another curve that started here and ended here, no matter how it looked like, we're still going to get the same answer. <laughs> All right, let's get rid of that. So, what's the final conclusion here? What do we need? So, our original problem was F and C, right? So, our answer tells us that we need little f. We got capital F. We need little f, and we need the starting and ending point. So if you have something that's path independent, it turns out that your final answer, in your final answer, all you need is a potential function. All you need are the potential function. A start and end points. So all you need is your starting and your ending points and your potential function. Let's take a look at the problem that we were doing. We, we don't, we, do we have the potential function? We don't have the potential function. We have the starting and ending points, right? So, potential function, where are you? Sorry. So given our vector field, or let me rephrase that, given our gradient field, how do you suppose we're going to find F? Now remember the gradient field, this, your gradient field is a vector of partials. Right? So that means your vector field must be that same vector of partials. That means your f of x, or your f sub x, your partial of f with respect to x must equal to e to the negative y. And you can likewise say f of y I'm going to need to move this over here. So 
So if that's true, that means I had started with some original function and I took the derivative of that function with respect to x and I got e to the negative y. So I took the derivative of something with respect to x and I got this. So if I want the original function, so this is the derivative of something, why don't I take the antiderivative? That's the fundamental theorem of calculus again. So if I want to try to obtain my original function, let's take the antiderivative of e to the negative y with respect to x because I had taken the derivative of some original function with respect to x to get that so I want to go backwards let's take the antiderivative of that with respect to x to see if we can recover our original function so this is going to be equal to x e to the negative y something missing plus C wait C what's C no <laughs> I don't mean throw you up C is a constant. Thanks, Thomas. C is a constant. But when we take a derivative with respect to x, y is also a constant. Right? Now, x is not a constant because you're taking the derivative and integral with respect to x. But y could have been a constant. So imagine if you had your original function that had a y squared or something that you're adding. When you take the derivative of that with respect to x, ah, that y squared is gone, right? So if you're taking the antiderivative to get it back, we want to allow for those terms that may have a y in it. No x's, just y's. And so I'm going to use this notation, c, as a function of y. Maybe I'll call it C1 because I'm going to do the same sort of analysis for the second one. Okay? All right. So now we could take this one and do the same for it. Fy is equal to negative x e to the minus x. So if I was to try to recover the original function, I would probably want to take the antiderivative of this with respect to y. What? Oh, that should be y. This y. All right, so now take the antiderivative of that with respect to y. Now, x is a constant. And then there's a negative here, but when you take the antiderivative of e to the negative y, it'll be e to the negative y, then you do some substitution where the negative would come out. So it'll eventually make this into a positive. And there's a possibility of some other constant as a function of x only. Now, this is generally how I like to do it. There's other people that do it differently, 
But I do it like this. And so what I do at this point is I compare the two results that I have and see what I have in common. And I notice I have positive. It's important that the signs stay this, are the same for both of them. So I have e to the negative xy, or e to <laughs> f of xy is equal to x times e to the negative y plus. Now, I wanted this constant function of y in case there were any extra y's that came out of the second one. And I wanted this constant as a function of x in case I came out with any x's for the previous integration that I did. And I see that there's nothing missing or matching. And so I'll, I could just put a plus, and this is a real constant c now, not a function of x and y anymore. And actually, that constant function c, that constant c is, uh, is not going to be significant for us because we're going to do the fundamental theorem of calculus and you know that stuff disappears. Yes? So, um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, could we uh, transpose, uh, could we like add those two constants from each of those integrals and make it one C? Well, we don't add them together. I, I kind of, I use it to compare between the two answers that I have. And uh, if there are any missing terms, so it, it's better if we come up with another example where these things are not necessarily just plain constants. But the point is I have a potential function now, and I can ignore C if I want, but I have a potential function so that if I take the gradient of F, I will get exactly this vector field. All right? So we have the potential. We actually have the endpoints given to us. So let's actually do this problem. So the line integral of that vector field is actually just equal to our f function We'll evaluate it at the end point first, minus the same f function evaluated at the start point. So we have 8 e to the 0 minus 0, and that's the same answer that we got when we actually worked out the path integral. Okay. So this is the fundamental theorem of line integrals that allows us to, instead of actually doing the computation for finding the parameterization of the curve and doing that dot product business, instead of doing that, we can actually just work with the endpoints. That is if it is conservative, if F is conservative. Yeah? And this only works for line integrals? This only works for conservative line integrals. If it's not conservative, then we can't do it. I going to look. I will look. At the book.
It would be nice if there was a good way for us to check if something's conservative or not. Oh, I need to show you guys something else. All right, well, let's take a look at number 19. And I don't know if I want to do the whole thing, but let's just use this as an example of something that we're, we're talking about. So the basic idea is that we want to know if this is actually a gradient field. And if it's a gradient field, then there must be some function little f whose derivatives are equal to the components of this vector field. Right? So say if fx then is equal to x times y, then a possible, a potential function might look like the antiderivative of this thing with respect to x. So if I take the antiderivative of this thing with respect to x, y is a constant, so I'll just have a 1 half x squared times y plus some constant that might be a function of y. Now, if I do the same thing for y, that's equal to 3y squared. The original function might be antiderivative of 3y squared with respect to y. And this is equal to y cubed plus some constant that might be a function of x. Right? So now we try to match it up. Now this, there's a possibility that this y cubed might fit into this category of c1, c1 is a function of y. But this is not a solely a function of x. There's a y in here too. So at this point, we have to conclude that this is not conservative. Because the functions didn't match up. I can't find a function f of x or f of x, y, so that its partial with respect to x is the first component and its partial with respect to y is the second component. That function doesn't exist. So this is not conservative. And therefore, we can't use that path independent theorem that we did, the fundamental theorem of line integrals. OK? Not 
since they don't match up, since I can't come up with a function that would match up, they're not conservative. I mean, you can't find a function so that, well, let, let's see if I could just do another example. And then hopefully when I say match up, that makes a little bit more sense. So let's take a look at f equals x squared comma y squared. I think somewhere along the line we decided that this was conservative. But let's actually show that it is conservative. So the question is, is f equal to some gradient of some function? And what we could do is we can match each of these things up. So fx is equal to x squared. A possible candidate for function f would be taking the derivative of x squared with respect to x. And what is that? Like one third x cubed? And remember that we want a possibility that there's a, a, another term or two or whatever that might have a y in it. So fy is equal to y squared, and f is equal to the integral of y squared with respect to y, which is one-third y squared plus some function of x. So now can we match things up? So it looks like this thing will definitely be part of my potential function if it exists. My cube. So this will match up because that other c might is just a function of x. Now this would also match up because this c1 is a function of just y and this is a function of just y. So then I could probably have this looking like one third x to the, or y to the third power. And then I could throw another c there, but when I integrate, it's not going to matter. So now it matches. And to double check, you just make sure you take the derivative, you'll find the gradient of this, and you'll see that it actually is equal to x squared comma y squared. This one? Um, well, let's see. I don't know exactly what you mean, but is that a plus one there? Yeah. I would have a plus y here. And that's that would still be part of this. And it would still be okay because it's just a function of y. So what we didn't want to happen is that there's a term here with an x squared and a y that wasn't accounted for in the other in the other integral. So that's when it wouldn't work out so well. So it's the only so if they're of the same if the if, 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 if we uh, compare the constants and if there's only uh, so that if there's only x like let's say if for that upper you know, 
it was only a function of x and we compared it to that function on the bottom, yes. then it would be, that part would be conservative, and if that was, yeah, so if the y was non-existent, then... Correct, and then it would be okay. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So in three dimensions, when we have functions of x, y, and z, then your constants would be uh, c1 of yz and then c2 of xz and c3 of xy. You'll have three of them. Okay, so this would be a good way to actually find your potential function. But in terms of figuring out whether something's conservative, I guess this isn't too bad, right? But it turns out that there's another way to find out if something's conservative. And what I want to do is I want to fill in the blank later. Let's examine that if you have something that's conservative, then there exists a function f so that the derivative of f with respect to x is the first component. The derivative of f with respect to y is the second component. So it turns out that because of rules of making sure that our functions are nice, <laughs> nice. Um, remember the second order partial derivatives? F is, uh, how do we say it? Yeah, but the, 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 we have partial derivatives, so has, uh, has second order partials. Then it turns out that the mixed partials, f of xy, or f sub xy, and f sub yx, should be equal to each other. So we can kind of apply that to this concept, right? So let f equals p of x, y, and q of x, y. For some reason, they, they use p's and q's a lot. So f is conservative. if the partial of p with respect to x or y partial of p with respect to y because this is p fx is p so fx y partial of p with respect to y is equal to partial of q with respect to x. OK. 
Okay? Or if you subtract them, it's equal to zero. Okay? Any questions? So that's what I like to put up here. F is conservative if the partial of P with respect to Y is equal to partial of Q with respect to X. Okay, there's one more notation I realized as I was looking through some of the problems in the book. I realized that there's another notation for line integrals that I forgot to tell you, so I'd like to mention that now. And we'll come back and take a look at more conservative vector fields and try to find solutions for them. Um, So another notation for line integrals We know that line integrals start off looking like this right and then we kind of expand this and for now I'm going to go I'll stick with two dimensions we'll expand this as a line integral of f evaluated at some r function <clears throat> so I'm going to continue to expand this a little bit so this is equal to the line integral of uh, over curve c of of uh, oh, I'm gonna sorry, one more on the side here. P. Your vector field is PQ. All right, so then this is equal to P of X of T, Y of T, Q of X of T, Y of T, dotted with the derivatives, right? Uh, so been calling them x prime. I'm going to call them dx, dt, dy, dt. So if I actually go on and do my dot product here, this will be p times dx dt plus q of xy times dy dt.
And I know we're not supposed to cancel things, but just for the sake of notation, pretend you're canceling the DTs. And this is the other notation that people use a lot for line integrals. Now the P and Q may change, it may look different, or they might actually drop in the original, the actual function. But in general, this is how, uh, if you see something like this where there's a DX and a DY that's been separated like this, then you have to think of this as a line integral. Okay, so I realized that when I was looking through the, some of the problems in the problem set. All right, let's take a look at some, uh, some problems from your homework. I think this homework is not due until the following week, but we can take a look at them anyways. You have a couple of these problems where you have to determine whether something's conservative or not. Oh, you only have one of those problems. I don't know if I want to do any of these. All right, two, three, or four? Three. So determine whether or not f is conservative vector field. Now, remember, there's a quick way we could do this. We could take the derivative of well, the first component with respect to y, and then take the derivative of the second component with respect to x. And if they're equal, then they're conservative. Can you do that in your head? All right, well, you could do it that way. Um, I'll just make a note. We're not going to do it that way. We'll just say check to see if the derivative of the first component, that's e to the x cosine y, you take the derivative of that with respect to x, and then you take the derivative of the second component, e to the x sine y, with respect to, oops, I got it backwards, right? All right. So derivative of the first with respect to the second variable, derivative of the second with respect to the first variable. If those two are equal, then it is going to be conservative and we're good to go. Let's just say we did that and then they were equal. It is conservative. Let's actually find our potential function. So We'll find our potential function. We'll take a look at our fx. If this is, in fact, a gradient field, the first component is going to be the derivative of your function with respect to x. So that means to try to obtain the original function, we we'll need to take the antiderivative of this thing with respect to x. Oops, e to the x. cosine y dx 
And cosine y is a constant. The antiderivative e to the x is just e to the x. Right? Plus some constant. So we took it with respect to x, so the y is constant. So there might be some y function laying around somewhere. We'll take the second component. And take the antiderivative of that with respect to y. What's the antiderivative of sine? Negative cosine? Oh, it's not the same. So these two are not equal to each other. They're off by a negative sign. I thought they were. I did the derivative of cosine y in my head and I got positive sine y, so that was my mistake. So, not equal, not conservative. Let's check. All right, let me go back to the book to see if I can find some more interesting problems that we can think about. Let's do number 17. 17 or 18? Can you guys see? Pick one. So now let's jump up to three dimensions and see how this thing will work. Now checking to see if something's conservative in 3D is a little bit more difficult. Um, actually there's, there's a way to do it, but we're not going to see it until a couple of sections from now. So now let's just kind of go on blind faith and hopefully that this is actually conservative. So if we assume that the vector field is a gradient field, then we have to assume that the first component was a derivative of x of some original function, the second component was a derivative of y, and the third component was a derivative of z. So let's see, fx is equal to yz times e to the xz. Really? Oh, that's, that's okay. Um, so that means that F could actually be equal to the antiderivative of this thing with respect to X. And if we take the antiderivative of that with respect to X, YZ is constant. E to the XZ and then you have to have done a, a u substitution, right? If you let u equal to the exponent, you take the derivative of that with respect to x, you'll have an extra z outside. So that's an antiderivative, and then you have a possibility of a constant. Now x is your variable, and then you have two other variables that are potentially constant. So your 
y and z are actually constant with respect to x. So I want to watch out for any other functions that would pop out that are just functions of y and z down here. I'll cancel those z's. Um, the second one says that this derivative of your original function is equal with respect to y is equal to just xz, e to the xz. So if you take the antiderivative of this with respect to y, you're going to get y e to the xz plus another constant that's made of, possibly made of, y's and z's in it. And then the last one is xy e to the xz, which says that potentially we have xy e to the xz dz. Antiderivative with respect to z would give us an xy constant uh, e to the xz times the 1 over x if you let if you do a u-substitution. So, the z's would cancel, the x's would cancel, and then it looks like for all these things, our f of x, y, z function is equal to y times e to the x, z plus a constant if we care about that. Now this is our potential function. We're doing a line integral over this curve and then this tells us our end point. So our start point is that R evaluated at zero That's our start. So we put 0 in for t. We get 1, negative 1, negative, uh, nope, just 0. 1, negative 1, 0. And our end point is what happens when you evaluate at 2. So if we put 2 in there, we're going to get 5, 3, Zero. Okay. So our line integral is equal to the potential function evaluated at the end point minus the potential evaluated at the start point. So five in zero in for z would make this equal to one, so it's just a y. So three times one minus the y is negative one, and then times zero. So it looks like our final answer is just four. All right. <clears throat> So uh, we have uh, labs due tonight to help us prepare for tomorrow's lecture, or not tomorrow, but next week's lecture. And then uh, you, we have uh, homework due. Uh, you have two assignments, the first two. But I suggest that you got a good jump on this. You might as well start on the next one. So stay ahead of the game. Have a good weekend. <laughs>